Hello and uh, welcome to this discussion we're going to be having today. My name is James Edmondson. I'm a senior technology analyst at IDSecX. And today with me, I have two of my colleagues, uh, Yulin Wang and Zihao Li. And we are going to be discussing some of the emerging trends in logistics and um, service robotics. So just briefly before we start, can I get you, uh, Yulin, could you briefly introduce yourself? Sure, no problem. Hello, everybody. My name is Yulin and I work as a technology analyst at IDSecX. So my main focuses are service robots and uh, agricultural robots. Great, thank you very much. And Ziha? Hello everyone, my name is Holly and I'm also a technology analyst at Editatex. My focus is majorly on mobile robotics and I also cover a little bit about uh, haptics and I have a report of mobile robots available on our website. Great, thank you very much. So at IDTechX, we've been doing a lot of work on these robotics topics recently, so I thought it would be good to have a bit of a discussion with our two analysts here to uh, learn a bit more about these topics, just at a uh, sort of overall high level. So I'm going to start with the service robotics topic. So Yulin, when we talk about service robotics, what do we really mean by that? And what sort of robots are included in, in that uh, category? Yeah, no problem. So Service robots essentially cover a very wide variety of robots, including you know disinfection robots, kitchen robots, sofa robots, underwater robots, you know logistics and cleaning robots. So in the report uh, published by ID TechX, we pretty much cover all of these topics. So all of these robots can be called service robots because they are fundamentally designed to serve people or to support people. So different from traditional industrial robots that are typically used in the manufacturing industries. Service robots are typically used in the non-manufacturing businesses. For example, the food service industry or the cleaning industry, et cetera, right? So this is one of the features that um, differentiates service robots from the traditional industrial robots. Right, so I think that clears up that sort of distinction that people might have about those two different types. Yeah. I think, I think what we've seen through our research as well is that a lot of these markets for the service robots have been growing really rapidly. So what's what's driving that growth, especially in these recent years? Yeah, so um, as you said just now, you know, it's just like a so broad and each of the sectors has its own unique drivers, but there are also some some common factors driving the entire service robot industry, right? So these factors basically include, you know, increasing labor costs or decreasing the cost of the machines and COVID, et cetera. So for example, cleaning robot industry have gained significant momentum during the past several years because of COVID. And based on ID TechX investigation, what we found out is that more than 50 companies are now offering disinfection robots compared with um, two years ago when COVID started initially. And another example is the kitchen and restaurant robots, also called robotic waiters or robotic chefs. Uh, we all know that you know because of inflation, food is becoming more and more expensive these days, and the food in the food service industry is by nature a low margin industry. So the increasing labor costs and ingredient costs make the profit margin even thinner than before. Therefore, to resolve this issue, you know, kitchen and restaurant robots have been applied um, because they have higher efficiencies, lower operational costs, etc. So driven by this trend, ID Tech Act also believes that the market size of the kitchen and restaurant robots will surge in the upcoming decade. And the market size in 2032 will be 36 times the size of the market today. Well, that's obviously that's, that's a huge increase in what we're, we're expecting there. Yeah. And I guess given all those benefits that we just talked about, what would you say, what, why hasn't there been adoption so far and, and you know, or as much adoption as we might expect so far? And when we would expect that to change? Yeah, so there are several sectors um, that are holding back the industry. Uh, you know, first of all, the technology in some certain applications still lack technical robustness. For example, for underwater robots, you know, the harsh underwater environment, um, you know, have relatively low visibility or limited access to the um, GPS and many others, right? So these issues really make the technologies for, you know, underwater robots, as an example, extremely hard and extremely expensive thereby holding back their application or their commercialization in the um, civil applications because people are not able to afford them. So aside from the technologies, I guess another barrier that I want to bring up here is the market demand or like how much do people really use them. So if we look at the same example of like underwater robots, right, what we can find here is that people do not really trust the technologies of underwater robots. And depending on the applications, you know, people might not be using them very often, to be honest. For example, underwater robots can be used for inspections, 
whereas the inspections do not happen every day. And in fact, you know, like uh, it might just happen once or twice a year, you know, for inspections. So this kind of like low frequency usage also holds back the adoption of the underwater robot. However, we do believe that it is going to change because, you know, a lot of underwater robot providers have already noticed this. And some of them have already started to transition to a new business model called robotics as a service, meaning that they do not sell the robots directly, but choose to sell the service that to the customers. So this kind of new business model can significantly decrease the capital costs on, from the customers. That is why, you know, there is a potential to overcome this barrier in the future. Great. So, yeah, thanks very much for going over that topic. I think now I'd like to sort of change tax a little bit and move on to the sort of logistics and warehousing sort of uh, types of robots. So I think you see how, I mean, many of us will be aware of some form of automation in, in warehousing logistics and these sorts of things, but what, what's the new trends and, what, and what's changing there? Yeah, you are right. Many companies are now wanting to adopt uh, automation in their warehouses. And the, the biggest change we can see right now is that they expect more flexibility and scalability of mobile robot system in the warehouses. So that means we can see more and more infrastructure dependent, uh, the, auto, auto, the autonomous mobile robots, uh, i.e. AMRs in the warehouses. And the market share of uh, market value of AMRs has increased by nearly 42% from 2019 to 2021. So that's quite a big increase as well. Yeah, it is. So, so, so which the applications that we, we mentioned, so which, which of those are sort of the most mature applications at the moment? And then in the long term, what are we expecting to be sort of the bigger, bigger player, <laughs> uh, bigger uh, applications? Mm. So uh, the most mature technology is not AMRs, but the AGVs, the automated guided vehicles. This is because they use infrastructure for the navigation in the warehouses, so they are more reliable and the technologies are more developed. Uh, they were they were they were firstly introduced to the market in 1950s, so quite old. Uh, however, as I mentioned, the logistics industry wants the best flexibility and scalability. So the AMRs, the infrastructure independent solutions, will be the ultimate mobile robotic solution and Therefore, there will be the largest uh, market. And we estimate over 80% of the market share in the material transport robot market will be AMRs by 2014-2. Wow, okay, so yeah, big, big portions there. Yeah. So is there anything that's really holding back those AMRs at the moment? Uh, for AMRs and other material transport robots, in warehousing, uh, not really. There is no major challenges for them. But uh, we know there are a lot of other mobile robots in other sectors of logistics, and uh, there are barriers for those other robots. So, for example, the mobile picking robots in warehouses or factories, uh, the problem for them are the AI, the computing power, the dexterity at, of the picking and the factors. Uh, and recently, we can see more delivery robots outside. And for them, the main challenges are the uh, regulatory barriers. So many, many countries do not have well-established regulation for the delivery robots yet. And the examples and the use cases we see of mobile, uh, delivery robots, uh, they are just the trial operations, and they cannot be commercialized at scale now. So yeah, but all the mobile robots, uh, logistic mobile robots are the uh, markets with huge potentials and we believe the barriers will be overcome in the long term future. Great, thanks very much for going over that. So thank you very much uh, for your time today, uh, both you and Zihao. That's been a very quick overview of some of these uh, trends that we've seen in these markets. But we would just like to say that if um, you do want more information on this, these topics, ID Tech X has recently published reports on mobile robotics and also service robotics. Um, as well as other topics within robotics, which you can find on our website. Um, we also provide subscription platform where you can get more ongoing research as well as off the shelf reports, company profiles, general market trends, and much more. So please don't hesitate to get in contact with us if you are interested. Um, and thank you very much again for your time, uh, Zihal and Yulin, um, and we shall hopefully speak to you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, goodbye. All right.